you turn to Matthew chapter 22 and we'll continue where we left off last week. We're in verse 15 and we'll go to the end of the chapter or as there are three questions brought to Jesus and one that he will bring before those that are, that are questioning him. And I think they certainly have some uh, great relevance for uh, our lives as well. Uh, let's pray. Father, we, uh, we just come before you, Lord, as uh, Mark prayed earlier, that we just have a uh, ears to hear you, be able to put aside uh, the distractions of, of this life and, and just our own, uh, our own flesh sometimes and be able to really focus in on, on you and your word. And we ask your spirit to just minister to our hearts uh, this morning in Jesus' name. Uh, amen. Uh, in context, we're in what some people refer to as the Passion Week of Jesus or that last week or within within hours or, or just a few days of when he will be arrested, go through his his trials and, and eventually leading to uh, his crucifixion and resurrection. He has uh, marched into the city and been, been proclaimed by the people to be the Messiah. Uh, the city is, is jammed. It's Passover. There's two to three million people there. And, uh, and there are tens of thousands of people jammed into the temple area now each day uh, to hear Jesus teach. Uh, he has uh, healed people there in the, te at the temple. The kids there have been <laughs> praising him to be the Messiah. And the Pharisees have said, you know, how can you let them say that? And, and of course, Jesus continues to quote the scriptures and, you know, out of, out of the, uh, uh, the mouths of babes, you know, uh, praise has been ordained and so forth. And, and there's a, very much a drama this building uh, between the, the leaders that are, that are very directly uh, uh, confronting Jesus now. Uh, they will come to him in, in a sense, different sects of Judaism. Sometimes those you would not normally associate being together. And, uh, and this first group that comes, we'll see right away that this is an attempt by them to try to get Jesus to say something uh, that will get him arrested by the Romans because that's an easy out for them. Jesus being hailed as the Messiah, he's he healing everybody. The crowds are all around him and so forth. They want to kill him. They've stated that uh, already. But at the same time, they're afraid of the crowds. Let the Romans do it. And so they come with a, a very political question. It's one of loyalty, and we see that in verse 15. Then the Pharisees went out and laid plans to trap him in his words. They sent their disciples to him along with the Herodians. Teacher, they said... We know you are a man of integrity and that you teach the way of God in accordance with the truth. You aren't swayed by men because you pay no attention to who they are. Tell us then, what is your opinion? Is it right to pay taxes to Caesar or not? But Jesus, knowing their evil intent, said, You hypocrites, why are you trying to trap me? Show me the coin used for paying the tax. They brought him a denarius and he asked them, Whose portrait is this? And whose inscription? Caesar's, they replied. Then he said to them, give to Caesar's what is Caesar's and give to God what is God's. When they heard this, they were amazed. So they left him and went away. And as I mentioned, it's this first group is uh, uh, very, two very different political views. The Pharisees, of course, we've talked about a lot. And they would uh, be the ones that would, in a sense, they were the the Bible believers of their day, although, of course, many in their leadership have become very corrupted in terms of their hypocrisy that Jesus will talk about as we look at that in chapter 23. But they believed in, in, uh, in all of the Old Testament in terms of the Torah, the, uh, the five books of Moses, all the poetical books, and all of the historical books that would have include all of the prophecies. Uh, they would have also accepted the oral uh, traditions of, of the elders at that point. The Herodians that are with them, again, keep in mind, are the ones that would be Herodian. They are loyal to Herod. Herod is appointed by Rome. So in a sense, they're willing to submit and accept Rome's authority over them. 
So these, these two groups of people would be like taking a bunch of Republicans and Libertarians and putting them together or, or you know, something like that. These are two groups of people that would not normally even talk with each other, uh, other uh, in, uh, otherwise uh, just to argue and so forth. But here they're, they're, they're together because of their common enemy, uh, Jesus. There are the Sadducees. We'll see them in a moment. They are the theological liberals. They hold only to the, they only believe that God's word is the, the Moses writing, the Torah, the first five books, and, uh, and they are the, the liberals. They don't believe in miracles, they don't believe in angels, they don't believe in resurrection, and, and so forth. And certainly we could liken them to the theological liberals of today. Two other sects that are uh, on the scene that we don't see in this text, the, uh, the Essenes who lived uh, uh, in communally, uh, outside in isolated areas. They were the scribes that lived very simple uh, lives. And then the zealots who were the, uh, the militants that uh, believed they should overthrow Rome by, by violence. And, and they would try to do that from, from time to time. But we've got this, uh, these two groups, the Pharisees and the Herodians coming together. And they tried to uh, flatter Jesus. We know that you speak and teach what is right. You don't show partiality. You teach the way of God according to the, uh, the truth and so forth. And, and Jesus obviously sees uh, right, right through them. Uh, Jesus modeled for us a life of servanthood and taught us that if you want to be great in the kingdom of God, you must become the servant of all. But we also see with Jesus that he never allowed himself to be manipulated by others. And sometimes we need to be careful that in our attempts to be the servant of all, we don't allow ourselves to be manipulated by others. When we do that, we are in servitude to them, and that's different. One is by choice because I love the Lord and want to serve him. I love others around me. I choose to serve them. The other one is, is, is not by choice simply because I've been manipulated into it. It's not just something that goes on in the world, unfortunately. It's something that we see in the church uh, all the time. Uh, but Jesus deals with it here by direct confrontation. I know you're trying to trap me. He just goes, right. oh, you're such a great teacher. Oh, a man of integrity. Oh, you speak the truth of God. What is your opinion on this? I know what you're up to. So there's sometimes that Jesus deals with the manip manipulation by directly uh, just point pointing it out. Uh, I know that you've just insulted me. Let's get past the insult. What do you really want to say? It might be a line that we might use with, with people sometimes. Uh, there are other times when Jesus walks away. He just knows, I'm not even going there. Uh, he's insulted. There's an attempt to manipulate him, to get him to do something he would not normally do, to get him to say something he would not normally say. And he just says, I'm out of here. And he walks away. And, and certainly good examples for us. And we need the spirit of God to help us make that uh, distinguish between the two. But secondly, they ask him again a political question. In Luke's gospel in uh, chapter 20, verse 20, uh, gives us a little more insight. It says, they hope to catch Jesus in something he said so that they might hand him over to the power and authority of the governor. So the, the question, you know, are we to pay the, the tax or not? We don't really get it in the English translation, but it's, it's a specific tax and it's called the poll tax. There were a lot of taxes the Jews had to pay. They didn't mind paying the temple tax. They didn't mind giving to the, uh, the coffers of their own country. They hated giving money to Rome directly. And every time they had to pay the poll tax, it was an admission. It was an admission that, that this Gentile nation, that this uh, Roman authority was ruling over them. It was, a, it was an admission of their own lack of, a lack of rights and privileges and, and so on and so forth. Uh, and they hated uh, every Jew hated paying the poll tax. And, and that's the one they say. Jesus, is it right for us to pay the poll tax and admit that we're under the thumb of, ro of Rome? Is it right to do that? Is what they're saying. And uh, Jesus has got, they would think, two, two positions here. He could either say, yes, it is right, we need to do that, uh, in which case the crowds would all turn against him because they, they hate paying this tax. Or he could say, no, we should never pay that tax, in which they would go, gotcha. We call the Roman authorities, and we have them arrested and, and put on trial for, for treason and so forth. So they, this is kind of a, they, they believe they've got them, uh, uh, they've thought this thing through, and they think they've got them in, in kind of a gotcha uh, moment. But again, the, the question, secondly or thirdly, uh, the answer centers around the idea of, uh, of loyalty, 
And, uh, and in Jesus' day, there were Jewish coins, Greek coins, Roman coins. Uh, and so he asked for a denarius, which is a Roman coin. It's the coin that they would have paid the tax. The other thing you need to know is that Jews don't normally carry this coin because they're not going to carry a Roman coin around. They're just not going to do it. I mean, they, they hate the Romans. The Romans are oppressing them, overtaxing them. And uh, it was just a horrible life be, uh, because of the Roman authority over them. They're not going to carry a Roman coin on them. So it's very interesting. Is it right to pay the poll tax, the admission uh, of our submission to this, uh, this Roman government? Well, if anybody got a denarius, they're like, <laughs> no, nobody would want to admit that they've got one of these coins in their pocket. But if they're going to go forward with this thing, somebody's got to cough it up and uh, go, yeah, here. It wasn't worth much, but it, it's a Roman coin none, nonetheless. Yeah, I, I, I've got one. Oh, what are you doing with one? No, just give the coin to him. I mean, so all of this is, uh, is going on there. And then he asks, whose inscription is, is on it? And of course, uh, rulers in that day uh, minted coins with, with their, their pictures and their inscription on it. So Caesar's is on it. So he holds it up and says, uh, give to Caesar's what is Caesar's and give to God what is God's. It's based upon this statement and further the teachings of Paul that we'll look at in a moment that we have this concept in our own government, the separation of church and state. It's based on, on this teaching of Jesus right here. There are certain things that government should control and there are certain things that only God should control. Give to the government what the government is due them but give to God what is God's, because after all, his is the higher authority of the two. And from this, we get a couple of basic concepts that, that we follow in our government uh, because of this teaching. One is that the state has the right to collect taxes. Uh, Jesus, again, has said that uh, there, there are the government authorities. Paul expounds upon this in, in, in Romans 13. Be before I read this, though, keep in mind the fact that living under the Romans you had to, uh, to uh, occasionally stand before an altar, take a pinch of incense and put it on the altar and say, Caesar is Lord. Since about 30 BC, the Caesars began to claim that they were deity, uh, that they were gods, and they demanded to be worshipped. The Christians, of course, the ones that were loyal to Jesus would refuse to do this, in which case they would be martyred for their faith. It was either Caesar is Lord or, or Jesus is Lord. And because of that, uh, thousands, if not millions, of Christians were martyred for their faith during the first couple of, uh, couple of centuries. So the idea then that it's to that government that you're to submit and pay taxes was a, we'd say is a hard pill to swallow. But uh, nonetheless, this is what Paul says in Romans 13, 1. Everyone must submit himself to the governing authorities. For there is no authority except that which God has established the authorities that exist have been established by God. Consequently, he who rebels against the authority is rebelling against what God has instituted. And those who do so will bring judgment on themselves. So who is to submit? Everyone. Why? It's because God is the one that has instituted uh, government. And by the way, Paul goes on in this passage and talks, talks about the fact, and it's, and it's to this government that God's instituted that he's allowed them to bear the sword for the protection of, of the people and so forth. So uh, in, in that sense, uh, people that serve, uh, you know, in, in the police department or in the military as that sort of the government are actually fulfilling a, a God-given institution and duty uh, in, in defending the, the citizens. Therefore, I like to say, I really appreciate all the non-Christians that serve in the military. The Christians, hey, they're serving, serving God and country when they're doing it. Uh, they're fulfilling a, a destiny and a duty that's actually in Scripture. But we really appreciate that the non-Christians do that as well. Amen? Because there, there's a whole lot of them out there serving, <laughs> serving as well. But this is all instituted. If you've ever been to a, a country with not much government, you understand the concept. It's, it's kind of wild, you know, if you've ever been to like a, what we call a third world country where there's not a lot of government, there's not a lot of law enforcement. It's just kind of, it's like the, the old west. And, uh, and you think, I'm sure I'm glad, <laughs> I'm sure I'm glad that, that there is a, 
a, a government over us with real <laughs> rules and regulations. It's like driving on the streets of India and there's no stop signs. It's kind of like a destruction derby. Not like a NASCAR race, it's more like a destruction derby. And you, you, you long for the days of rules and regulations and law enforcement uh, instituted by God. Let me go on to verse 4. Uh, excuse me, verse 5 of that same passage, Romans 13. Therefore, it is necessary to submit to the authorities, not only because of possible punishment, but also because of conscience. This is all, also why you pay taxes. For the authorities are God's servants who give their full time to, to governing. So again, very clear here that as believers, based on the teaching of Jesus, what Paul says here, we're certainly to pay our taxes. It's God who's instituted government. But secondly, give to Caesar what's Caesar, but give to God's what's God's. We have an obligation to give to God what is rightfully his. And that's everything else. <laughs> uh, that's our lives, our, our possessions. God is the, is the greater uh, authority. Uh, again, it's uh, our founding fathers understood this, this idea that God has sets up government, but God is the greater authority over that government. And there's going to be times when the, to the best we can, we want to submit to that government, but there's going to be times when that government goes against conscience and faith. And at that point, we have to submit to the higher authority, which is God. That's what our founding fathers did. There were a bunch of Christians living on the East Coast, and they were under the authority of the British rule and the British Empire. According to the teaching of Jesus and Paul, they should have submitted to that, to that, teach, to that government that was there, and they did. To the degree that they could, paying taxes, whatever it was, however unjust it might have been, until that government, the British Empire, kept them from having freedom to, re to worship the way that they wanted to. When they said, you must worship our state church and only our state church, that's when they said, well, we can't really do that. We're going to submit to the higher authority, which is God's, and then they rebelled against that governmental authority. That's, that's why we're, we're all Americans here today. <laughs> that's why we have the freedom to, to worship in any church, any denomination, and, and so forth. Uh, we see it in the book of Acts, in Acts chapter 4. Peter, James, and John are arrested for preaching the name of Jesus and healing and so forth. They're beaten, they're in prison, they're brought back before the Sanhedrin, the ruling authority established by God, and they are told by that authority, preach no longer in the name of Jesus, tell no one else about Jesus and his death and his resurrection. And they said, should we submit to God or should we submit, excuse me, should we submit to man or should we submit to God? And they said, we're going to submit to God. In fact, they went back and prayed for a greater boldness that they would be able to go on, do what they were doing before, despite that, that it might mean further imprisonments and beatings and, and so forth. And it's why we smuggle Bibles in, into China as well. We just believe that the greater authority is God. And even though what we do is illegal uh, in, in terms of the Chinese government there, we are going to submit to the, the greater authority of Jesus who says, take the gospel into all the world. So it's a very uh, much a political question. It has to do with loyalty. Give to the government what's theirs, but really there should be the loyalty in our hearts to God for everything else. And then secondly, there's a question that I think that, that I think all these tie together to some degree. Uh, the second question proves a theological position about resurrection and we see this with another group, the liberals, the Sadducees in verse 23. That same day, the Sadducees who say there is no resurrection came to him with a question. Teacher, they said, Moses told, that if, told us if a man dies without having children, his brother must marry the widow and have her children for him. Now there were seven brothers among us. The first one married and died. Since he had no children, he left his wife to his brother. The same thing happened to the second and third brother, right down to the seventh. Finally, the woman died. Now then, at the resurrection, whose wife will she be of the seven, since all of them were married to her? Jesus replied, you are in error because you do not know the scriptures or the power of God. At the resurrection, people will neither marry nor be given in marriage. They will be like the angels in heaven. But about the resurrection of the dead, have you not read what God said to you? I am the God of Abraham, the God of Isaac, and the God of Jacob. He is not the God of the dead, but of the living. When the crowds heard this, they were astonished at his teaching. 
So again, the Sadducees come not with a political question, but a theological question in regards to resurrection. And, uh, and Matthew records for us so that we'll know they do not believe in, in the resurrection. And again, they only believe or hold to the authority of the first five books uh, of the Bible. Therefore, the Pharisees and the Sadducees that believe in the resurrection, they had just like a couple of arguments over this. It was like constant. It's been going on for centuries, right? But the Pharisees have a hard time trying to make their case only using the writing of Moses. They want to refer to the prophets. They want to refer to what Job said. They want to refer to what, you know, what the Psalms say. But, but if they're really going to connect with these guys and make their point, they gotta, they've got to do it with the teachings of, of, uh, of Moses. The Sadducees come up with this. Um, secondly, uh, they try to use the law of Moses to prove their point, this hypothetical illustration based on Deuteronomy 25, 5 to 10, what we call the Leverite marriage has nothing, nothing to do with the tribe of Levi. It's just from the Latin word lever. And so the Leverite uh, marriage, which said, because it was so important to them to have a heritage, if somebody was married and then he died, uh, then the brother would come along and marry uh, that, uh, his brother's wife, so that he could have children by him, so his name could be carried on in Israel, because it meant everything in terms of who got what property. God gave each tribe, gave each family, each clan, all the way down to each person, and the idea is it would get, it would get passed on. It's still, uh, we want to probably see it so much in our own culture, but in many Eastern cultures today, it is very, very important to have a male child and pass that name on. And, uh, and so there was a provision made in the law of Moses for it. So these guys come up with, I got to believe somebody's cracking up when they're going through this. I mean, it's like this guy gets married and, he and then the brother and then he died and then the brother and he died and then all the way to the seventh. It's like, is anybody going, what is she cooking? You know, and was the, was the sixth guy a little nervous about marrying her after five brothers are dead? You know, uh, you know, it's, it's kind of a, a wild situation that they come up with. But again, it's based on the word of God and it's based for them on the Torah, on the writings of Moses. And what's their point to try to make a case that, see, there can't be any resurrection. This would be ridiculous. How could this woman have seven, seven brothers in the future? If God allows her to marry seven here, it means there is no resurrection. That's their, uh, their point here. And what Jesus does is, is says, uh, you err because you don't know the scriptures, nor do you know the, the power of God. And he, just, and he basically just says, in heaven, it's not an issue because no one dies in heaven. There's no need to have children in heaven. We're going to live for all eternity. So there's neither marriage nor giving in marriage. And he says, like the angels that are not married or given in marriage, he doesn't say we become angels. You kind of get this. Well, my Aunt Mary, you know, she passed away a few years ago. I know she's an angel in heaven. No, she's not an angel in heaven. If she knew the Lord, she's in heaven, but we don't like turn into angels when we, when we get there. They are a separate class of uh, beings and so forth. That's not what Jesus is saying, but he is saying that uh, they are incorrect uh, in terms of their uh, assumptions. And then he deals with this whole issue of, uh, of the um, resurrection. And this, and this is kind of beautiful what he does. He, he takes uh, the, the, uh, the epitome of, of all the scenes of, of the life of Moses. I mean, this is they only follow the teaching of, and the writing of Moses. So he goes directly to the scene of of Moses at the burning bush. Moses, when he's out there in the desert, the first time he gets this face-to-face -face encounter with God, it's recorded in Exodus 3, 5. There the Lord says, do not come any closer, God said. Take off your sandals, for the place you are standing is holy ground. Then he said, I am the God of your father, the God of Abraham, the God of Isaac, and the God of Jacob. At this, Moses hid his face because he was afraid to look at God. So Jesus quotes this and then says, God identifies himself with these men. Are they dead or are they alive? Is God dead or is he living? You've got to make up, make up your mind. Because obviously they would never deny that God was, was living, that God was alive. God doesn't say, uh, I am the God of of who used to be Abraham at one time was, it was Jacob when he was living. And you remember that other guy when he was still alive? No, he says, I am the God of. And he completely identifies himself with these three men, the patriarchs, and identifies the fact that they are living. 
And in fact, it's in Luke's Luke gospel that Jesus concludes, therefore, he is not the God of the dead, but of the living, for to him all are alive. And so he's able to take the scriptures that they did believe in and prove to them the fact that there is a, is a resurrection. And if there's not, we got a real problem with the nature of God because he identifies with these three men. Therefore, they're, uh, they're alive. Their big issue, though, has to do with the statement that Jesus said that we know from uh, John eleven twenty five. 25. Uh, the, again, the scene that sets everything in motion in terms of the death and resurrection of Jesus is raising Lazarus from the dead. That's, if you go back, that's the domino that follows and everything follows uh, after that. And during that time, when all those people are gathered, and, and uh, Martha's at his knees, basically <laughs> chewing him out because he wasn't there on time uh, to save her brother, he says, I am the resurrection and the life. He who believes in me will live even though he, he dies. And whoever lives and believes in me will never die. Do you believe this? And then Martha certainly has got a decision she's got to make. And not only in terms of, is Jesus the Messiah, but is he, is he the Messiah who is God come in the, in the flesh that has the power to call death back to life? The Sadducees have a little problem with that since they don't believe in resurrection. Now we've got a guy that's the Messiah that claims and does call people back from the dead and says he is the resurrection and the life. And if you believe in him, you'll never die. That's the real issue here. They're trying to confront that. And Jesus is able to take the scriptures that they do believe in and show that there is a, is a resurrection. There's a political question about loyalty. Should we really give God everything? Yes, because he is the resurrection and the life, and we will live for all eternity. I think these things are, are tied together here. The third thing, there's a, uh, a principled question about the law. Now, we've got another, another group coming here, verse 34. Hearing that Jesus had silenced the Sadducees, uh, the Pharisees got together. Do you think that they got a kick out of Jesus shooting those <laughs> Sadducees down? I mean, they're probably going, yeah, right on. What didn't we think of that argument? Are you kidding me? We could have had them, you know, but, uh, but now they've, they've got to come back. Verse 35, one of them, an expert in the law, tested him with this question. Teacher, which is the greatest commandment in the law? Jesus replied, love the Lord your God with all of your heart, with all of your soul, and with all of your mind. This is the first and greatest commandment, and the second is like it. Love your neighbor as yourself. All of the law and the prophets hang on these two commandments. So, uh, first, we say that it's a Pharisee that asks a question about the greatest principle or commandment in the law. It says that he's considered to be a, an expert in the law. Now, I want to take you to Mark's gospel because it, it helps, uh, fills us in. We were talking about this a little bit yesterday in our men's study on, on Saturday uh, in terms of, uh, uh, of this guy and his comments and so forth. But uh, Mark, Mark gives us a, a little insight here that I think is interesting uh, because I, I think all along, because when we get to chapter 3 next week, Jesus is just blasting these guys, man. He just rails on them. He just goes after them. It's, uh, he's not nice. He's probably yelling and screaming at them by at that point. But I think at this point, he's still trying to reach them. He's still trying to give them reasoned, sound arguments. Think it through. Think about the scriptures. You know, what do they say the Messiah will be? He's getting ready to come up with a real zinger here in a moment. But, but again, he's trying to reach this guy in particular, I think. Mark's gospel, Mark 12, 32. Well said, after he says this, this guy says, Well said, teacher, the man replied, You're right in saying that God is one and that there is no other but him. To love him with all of your heart, with all of your understanding, with all of your strength, and to love your neighbor as yourself is more important than all burnt offerings and sacrifices. When Jesus saw that he answered wisely, he said to him, you are not far from the kingdom of God. Uh, this was an issue that they debated all the time. 1613 commandments. Who can keep them all? So what they did in their tradition, they divided them into categories, what they called heavy laws and light laws, important laws, less important. So they try to keep focus on the heavy, <laughs> the ones that are more important. Of course, the uh, it's just an illusion because uh, scripture says if, if you break one, you're guilty of, uh, of all. But they were constantly debating what is the greatest commandment. And, uh, and here Jesus is able to sum it up. This guy, an expert in the law, but apparently maybe with a bit of honesty in his heart, 
really says to Jesus, you're right. That's it. That's more important than all the burnt sacrifices and all the offerings. That's quite a statement for a Pharisee to make, uh, by the way. And Jesus says, you're not far from the kingdom of God. Uh, again, there's something that still in this. Jesus taking them on theologically, politically, intellectually, but there's still a compassion in his heart to, to reach anybody that, uh, that would listen. Uh, and, and he does answer them very directly. He says uh, to the question of what is the greatest, the first and the greatest, uh, love the Lord your God with all your heart, soul, mind, and strength. Love your neighbor as yourself. And what he's doing in the first part is quoting the Shema. Uh, this is something that every Jew said every day, that every, every Jewish mother said to her baby every day and probably over her belly when they were still pregnant every day. You know, uh, hear, O Israel. And that's what the Shema means. It means to hear. Hear that the Lord is God, that he is one. As opposed to uh, the pagan nations that worship idols and the, and the pantheon of, uh, of gods that are uh, worshipped around them. Our God is not like that. He is one. And we're to worship him, again, uh, with all of our heart, soul, mind, uh, and strength. That is the, the, the greatest commandment. And again, if we do that, there'll be the love in our heart than to love our neighbor as ourself. This is not an Old Testament concept, by the way. Obviously, it's there. This is the heart and soul of the New Testament. In fact, we refer to it, uh, many writers refer to it as the royal law of love. Well, as, as New Testament believers, are you to keep any of the laws? Yes, there's one, the royal law of love. If we love God with everything we've got, our neighbor is ourself, pretty much everything else is going to uh, take care uh, of, uh, of itself. So Jesus is able to, to, in a sense, minister to this guy and this very important concept uh, there's, there's a loyalty issue that's here. There's the, the theological issue of, of resurrection that has to be established. Uh, but our relationship with the Lord is based on, on his love for us and, and therefore the love that we can have for others. Now he makes it very personal. The fourth question Jesus asks them, uh, he asks a personal question about the Messiah, verses 41 to 46. While the Pharisees were gathered together, Jesus asked them, what do you think about the Christ? Whose son is he? The son of David, they replied. He said to them, how is it then that David, speaking by the Spirit, calls him Lord? For he says, the Lord said to my Lord, sit at my right hand until I put your enemies under your feet. If then David calls him Lord, how can he be his son? No one could say a word in reply. And from that day on, no one dared to ask him any more questions. Uh, here Jesus asks an, an indirect question, uh, but, with, but it's a personal thing about the Messiah. Now remember to his own guys up there in what we call the Mount of Transfiguration when he's got Peter, James, and John, he says, uh, who, who, do, who do men say that I am? Some say Elijah, some say the prophet, some, yeah, but who do you say that I am? That's a very direct question. Who do you say that I am? He doesn't do that with these guys. It's an indirect question. He kind of cloaks it in, a, in another theological argument. We're having some theological debates here, some political debates here. We've settled what the greatest commandment is. Let me ask you guys a question. You know, whose son will the Messiah be? And of course, they're all going to say, son of David, son of David. You know, and in fact, that's, uh, that is what uh, even the lepers would cry out to Jesus. Son of David, have mercy on us. Everybody knew that the Messiah had to be in the lineage of, of David, the promise to David. You'll raise someone up that will sit on your throne and he'll rule forever and ever and ever. So uh, the Messiah has got to be the, the son of David and, uh, in, his, in his lineage. And Jesus was. Legally, uh, Joseph adopts uh, uh, Jesus. Uh, and, uh, and so he legally is in the lineage of David through Joseph. By blood, Mary also was in the, the lineage of David. So by blood, uh, he also uh, is, is the son of David. And so he fits the requirement. He is the son of David. But then Jesus, they all go, son of David. Okay, good. Now let me give you a little riddle to figure out here. And he quotes Psalm 110.1. And uh, in there, uh, in the Old Testament, uh, proper, more properly written or fully written, it says the Lord, and it's capital L, capital O, capital R, capital D. And every time you see that, it means it's Yahweh. They're not going to Y-H-W-H. The name of God that's not pronounceable, or we say Yehovah, uh, maybe more correctly, Yahweh. So he, uh, he says, David says that, that Yahweh says to my Lord, Adonai, uh, sit at my right hand, the place of authority and the place of, of power. 
<laughs> so, uh, until I make your enemies a footstool. So, so they're going, yeah, I never really thought about that before. <laughs> he, he's, here's David, the greatest king of Israel. The Messiah's got to be his son. But would David's son, would David ever say to his son that you are Adonai and you sit at the right hand of Yahweh, the most powerful, uh, you know, place in, in the universe? Would David ever say that? How could David say that if it's his son? And they're like, it's like the wheels are spinning, but at the same time, there's only one conclusion. The Messiah has to be existent before David. If he's sitting at the right hand of, of God Almighty, then the Messiah is, is going to be equal with God, God come in the flesh. The, but to be David's son, he's got to take on human flesh so he can be born in his lineage so he can be the son of David. And, and, and Jesus is making a brilliant attempt to try to get them with the scriptures that they believed in to get it. Because this, this is a hotly debated issue. Continues to be among Jews today. Messiah, is there one or is there two? Because Isaiah says the Messiah will come and be the suffering servant that will die for the sins, sins of Israel and, and the whole world. But at the same time, the scriptures are very clear that he'll be the conquering king that will establish his kingdom. Uh, and of course, if you're living under tremendous oppression, you kind of want the, the conquering king guy and not, not the suffering servant guy to, to show up. And, uh, and even at this point in time, the followers of Jesus and his disciples, they're still kind of looking for that conquering king guy. They're going to have real trouble, even though Jesus keeps telling them, I'm going to die for the sins of the world. I'm going to be taken by the Gentiles. I'm going to be turned over by your rulers. I'm going to, to die, but I'll rise again from the dead. But Jesus kind of tries to bring this to a very personal point with them. Uh, there, there's a loyalty issue with God. There's the idea of the resurrection and that he is a living God and you can have resurrection life in him. Uh, but again, will you commit to the Messiah who is both God, in, God of all eternity and yet be reconciled with the fact that he, is, he also is a man? That's a tough theological bridge to come. It's a little easier for us. We're, we're on this side of the resurrection and so forth. But Jesus is trying to, to, to bring them to the point where they can engage their minds. I, I just got to tell you, you know, if it was me, I would have just blown these guys off a long time ago. <laughs> they would have been way, way, way past this. But he is trying to make an attempt theologically, intellectually to still engage them in the scriptures and say, how can it be? It's a riddle. It's an enigma. What's the answer? They all know the answer. I mean, I kind of had to walk us. We kind of read that and go, uh, yeah, okay, uh, what, what does that say again? But these guys knew the answer. These guys know the scriptures. They know the answer. Uh, it's obvious to them. But none of them ad admit it. And they're just silent. And they don't ask them anything else. And they just walk away. And, uh, and that's kind of the, uh, the, the scary part uh, to this whole thing. Uh, Passover uh, is days ahead. Uh, in the temple proper, the priests are up there inspecting the lambs. They got to be without spot, <laughs> without defect, if, if they can be Passover lambs. In a sense, Jesus is down here in the other part of, of the temple in, the, in, the, in Solomon's colonnade in the portico area, and he's having these discussions, and he's being inspected, and he's been found to be without spot and without defect as well. And now the stage is set. But he's going to come back one more time with these guys, in a sense, lay into them, I think because he really cares for the people and these, these guys are blind guides that are, that are leading many of them uh, astray. I think there's two things that we can, should take away from these, these questions. One is the reminder of, of the royal law of love, that we're to love the Lord our God with all, all of our heart, soul, mind, and strength. Render unto Caesar what is Caesar's, hey, and then give God uh, everything else. And, and then what I, uh, I think that, that goes with it. I've kind of termed it the royal law of loyalty. I think they, they, they fall together. Uh, and certainly uh, the platform for everything that, uh, that is said there is, is the idea of, of resurrection and being with the, the Lord for all eternity. <clears throat> we, had, um, we just saw a film about India a, a couple of weeks ago. It kind of brought a lot of memories back and everything. And one of the, one of the major scenes is, is then the, uh, the slums in, in, in Bombay, which I spent a, a day in the last time we left, uh, uh, left uh, India and everything. I, I read this little uh, folk story uh, that Christians tell in southern India uh, that I thought was uh, <clears throat> kind of
kind of cute and applicable for us, but a common story, and it goes like, and it goes like this. There's a little boy, and he's a great marble player, and he's walking through his neighborhood, and he's got the, a pocket full of marbles to prove how good he is, because he can get in there and win everybody's marbles. Uh, and he's got one, this little blue marble. It's got some cracks in it. He can feel it in his pocket, but that's the one. That's his best shooter. But he goes along, and he's walking through his neighborhood, and there's a little girl there. She's eating a bag of chocolates. There's one thing he likes as much as marbles, and it's chocolate. So he, he concocts an idea. He says, so the little story goes, he says to her, uh, I tell you what, he says, I, I've got a whole pocket full of marbles here. I'll trade all of my marbles for your chocolates. And she says, well, that's more than fair. And so he says, okay. So he reaches his hand in his pocket, and he goes down till he finds the blue one, and he can feel it. And then he drops that in the bottom of his pocket and then grabs all the other marbles. Because if he's got the blue ones, he can win them all back later. All right? So he gives her all the marbles. She gives him the bag of chocolate. And he goes walking along. And, but he stops and turns and he says, is this all the chocolates? In other words, is, did she do what he did? Because yeah, that's, that's, that's in the heart of man. This idea of, I'm giving you everything. Almost. Uh, one writer said about this little story, he says, often our fallen nature persuades us to posture ourselves in the same deceptive and defiant attitude as the boy in the story. We want everything the kingdom of God has to offer. We want to have a secure sense of God's presence. We want all of our prayers to be answered. We want to feel close to Jesus. We want to flourish in the riches of God's glory. We want it all. But we are unwilling to give up everything for it. Many times there is a blue marble in our lives that we seem unwilling to offer to the control of Christ until we can fully subjugate ourselves to God's will. Our participation in God's kingdom will be limited. There was a young Pharisee who was an expert in the teacher and the law that was close to the kingdom of God, Jesus said. And I think he didn't come to the kingdom of God that day. Maybe he did later but because there was a few blue marbles in his pocket that he walked away with. I think the concern for us is the same. Do we really believe in the royal law of love as well as the royal law of loyalty? Do we really love God and then love others? And do we, uh, do we really show it because of our loyalty of, I render unto Caesars, but Lord, my life is, is yours. And what I want to suggest is that if you've got a blue marble in your pocket, it might be a good time to, get, to give, it, give it up for something a lot better than a piece of chocolate in terms of what the Lord has for us. Amen. The eyes of the blind will open, the ears of the deaf will hear. Turn the mirror to shout for joy And the Lord will cause the lame to lead like it He will see the glory of the Lord He will see the glory of the Lord Strengthen the arms of weakness 
Eternal 
No more, no more. 